make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> and, but I think the, the challenging thing, and for me as somebody who's uh, you know white and Christian myself, um, I think that the disturb, more disturbing thing is that these if people who hold these Christian nationalist views um, also are more likely to hold kind of anti-black views, anti-immigrant views, anti-Muslim views, anti-Semitic views. Hey, welcome back, faithful politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going, Josh? Hey, well, doing well. Thanks. And today we have with us Robert P. Jones. He is the president and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy. He's the author of a lot of books um, with his latest book called The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. And we are just so excited to have him here with us today. So welcome to the show, Robert. Thanks. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe you can we can start off this this talk with it, uh, you telling us like what is the PRRI and, sure. and why why did you feel a need to actually start the organization? Yeah. Well, uh, so it stands for Public Religion Research Institute. Um, we, as you said, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan um, organization conducting research at the intersection of religion, culture, and politics. And primarily what we do is public opinion survey work. Um, So we take the pulse of the American public uh, in uh, somewhere between, you know, eight or 12 uh, public opinion surveys a year uh, where we ask questions about all kinds of things, about politics, about religion, about culture, policy, um, and really just try to uh, describe, you know, what it really is a descriptive policy of kind of getting what people uh, think. We also uh, focus, because we focus on kind of religious Americans, um, we do tend to break out all of those by different religions. So what do, for example, white evangelicals uh, think uh, versus, uh, say, Latino Catholics uh, versus African-American Protestants? So what does the religious landscape and all of its diversity um, look like? So we were, uh, so I founded the organization in 2009. Um, So we're about to hit our 15th uh, year of, um, uh, of life as a, as a nonprofit. Uh, So we're very excited about that. Um, And um, uh, yeah, so I, 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 it's our, our primary mission, I should say is, is also to help journalists tell better stories about um, this, this intersection of religion, culture, and politics. So they're not, just relying on anecdotes or interviews, but there's actually some hard data uh, behind what religious Americans do and don't think about a whole range of things. Yeah, that you know that that's really helpful because um, I mean that th- there seems to be just like a handful of really good um, religion reporters, and I, and, and I, I I say handful because it it seems like it's a diff- it's like going into um, a wartime environment, maybe especially if you're not immersed already in that. <laughs> in that culture, uh, because, you know, I could imagine a reporter going into like a very Pentecostal church and wonder what all these things are for, you know? Um, so, so I, I really appreciate just the the work that you guys do. And I, I read just about all your stuff. So, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and we're, we're going to, we're going to talk to you a little bit more about, uh, some of the, the stuff that you, you put out, but, um, but I want to I want to just start off the conversation by talking about your your latest book um, and, you know, kind of in preparation for this um, chat, um, read the book. It's great. Um, but also I looked back to see some of the other books you you've written and there seems to be a theme um, specifically around like white people and. Um, you know, that there's this, I forgot, I forgot what the sort of pop culture thing is, but like people feeling guilty about being white. <laughs> and, and it seems like your, 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 your books probably don't have a large audience of people that are inclined to feel guilty about being white. Um, so, so maybe, maybe you can talk to us about, you know, the themes of your book and then specifically like what, what this latest book is about and what it's going to kind of add to the conversation. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Well, this is the, um, uh, so it's my fifth book overall, but the the last three have been trade books. So they've been intended for a broad audience and they all have 
really followed a theme. Now, I wish I could say I was one of those authors that 10 years ago, I planned out this trilogy of books and, you know, I had this big master plan, um, but it's not really the way it it turned out. Um, but, but, but basically the arc is this. In 2016, I wrote a book called The End of White Christian America. Um, and that book was really a demographic book. It was heavy on sociology, demographic analysis, and it was just tracing the trends, really, of what was going on in the religious landscape. And the big headline from that book is that um, the country had gone from a country that was majority white and Christian to one that was no longer a majority white and Christian. So just to put the number on it, um, uh, when I wrote that book in 2016, um, what I was tracking in the trend data was that if you put all white Christians in the country together, as recently as 2008, like when Barack Obama ran for president, the country was 54% white and Christian. So we took all white Christians together, Catholic, Protestant, non-denominational, whatever, 54% white and Christian. By the end of his term, when I wrote this uh, book, um, that number had dropped to 47%. Uh, um, that number today is 42 right? So it's continued uh, to drop. And, and what I thought was, I think, uh, important about that is that it it really is a, this sense I think particularly among white Christians that they are the majority the demographic majority the kind of political majority uh, in the country and that has been largely true for almost all of American history until this you know really the last twenty years um, and so that sea change in the American religious landscape is what I was trying to kind of write about in that book. And then in 2020, um, I wrote a book uh, called White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. And that book was um, really part memoir. So it was kind of taking, you know, some sociological data, but also looking at my own family's history. Um, so I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, for the most part. My extended family is from middle Georgia, uh, going back six generations uh, in middle Georgia in and around Macon, uh, Macon, Georgia. And so it was really looking at that history and the ways in which, um, you know, white supremacy had, had been really shot through my own family's uh, faith. Just one quick example. I had a, uh, you know, I have a family Bible in my possession that's been passed down on my mother's side of the family that was printed in 1815. And it's this old Bible. And in between the Old and New Testaments, it has, you know, births, deaths, marriages, all handwritten in the kind of brown oxidized ink from 150 years ago, um, in the, or actually almost 200 years ago now, um, in, in the Bible. And this was like one of the prized possessions on my mother's side of the family. It was passed down. It's the only object that I have that's that old. But I was doing some genealogical research on that family line and came across an estate settlement. And so here in the same family, right, that so valued their Christianity and this Bible, and there were all plenty of ministers in that line as well, Baptist ministers in, in the 19th century in, in Georgia, were also enslavers, right? Um, and so in that estate settlement from the same uh, family, you know, I found, you know, this estate settlement that listed, um, you know, one bay mare, one feather bed, six chairs, and then it listed four human beings, a woman named Naomi, and it had a dollar amount at five hundred dollars. A, bo a boy uh, named Bird at one hundred and fifty dollars. Right, and I could just read these human beings with these dollar amounts, and that this sat comfortably in this same family. This commitment to Christianity, this commitment to enslaving others based on their color of their skin, um, and the book was really about trying to disentangle those two things and, and showing how they're still wrapped up uh, in contemporary uh, Christianity today. And and the the, the current book, um, The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Past of Shared American Future, I'm kind of going back and forward. I, I go back uh, to try to trace the history um, further than that 19th century Civil War roots and how far back does it go. We can talk about that in a minute. So I, I trace it back to 1493, at least, um, a kind of fateful year in Christian history and American history, um, uh, or pre-American history, uh, and then bring it forward to looking at ways that, that three communities are still trying to wrestle with this legacy and try to uh, provide some healing on the ground in places like Mississippi and Oklahoma and, and Minnesota. You know, one of the uh, significant dates that you talk about in your works is May 5th, 1863. And I'd love for you to kind of talk about what that was and why it's so significant and even kind of give us some of the big significant dates and turning points um, that, that you found um, in your research um, that has led to the situation where we are today. 
Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with kind of go forward. I mean, I, I think 1493, um, you know, is a year that we, doesn't get a lot of attention. We all, you know, uh, many of us at least learned this little rhyme, you know, 1492 and Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So we know 1492. Uh, but what we don't know, know so much about, and I think it's much more important for the trajectory that um, our history takes, is what happened when Columbus went back uh, to Spain, uh, presents himself before um, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, and gets uh, re-equipped for a much bigger mission. And uh, in order to do that, he uh, and Spain uh, want to have a kind of moral justification for what they're about to do, and that is to kind of go by conquest to, um, uh, you know, enslave people, take their land, possess the land that's already occupied, right, by indigenous people. And who do they turn to? Well, they turn to uh, the head of the Catholic Church, at which at that time, uh, there was no Protestant Catholic split. So it's the head of the Western European Church um, uh, altogether. Uh, and um, and they get this, uh, you know, this series of rulings in the 15th century from uh, the head of the Christian Church in Europe that is, it's shocking when you read it. I mean, it is, you know, giving them permission that if they encounter any lands that are occupied by non-Christian people, and that's the key, right? That if they're non-Christian people, they have permission to take the land, uh, occupy the land, take all the goods, steal the goods. And there's this phrase um, that's just seared into my head, um, you know, that is also uh, to submit them to perpetual slavery is the line that's coming from the pen of the Vatican, uh, right? The head of the Western, uh, you know, European church there. And that sets really the trajectory for the entire Western relationship with indigenous people. Uh, it sets this tone for the transatlantic slave trade. Um, you know, and and really the the kind of moral foundations of of the country. Uh, so I think you know that date deserves a lot more attention um, than you know than it than it has, has really gotten it because it really is the where the moral compass is set um, and the justification for not only enslavement of African Americans but the genocide and uh, displacement of Native American peoples. Um, you know, in in this country. So I, I kind of. Pulling us back, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of further back in in in, in time, um, you know, another date I would I would give is 1845, actually before the Civil War. Um, and what happens, you know, there is um, that's the founding of the Southern Baptist Convention, um, and it's the split. Uh, the same year, the two the two largest uh, pro white Protestant denominations split. And they split over the issue of slavery. Uh, so the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church is split uh, with the Southern portions uh, forming the Methodist Episcopal Church South and the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, and what's not really, I think, uh, the pieces don't get put together this way, but really the, that's the dress rehearsal for the political secession that happens in the Civil War, because this, this predates that. So the churches actually, right, set the stage for political secession over the issue of slavery um, by, by the Southern churches saying we want a place where enslaving other people is compatible with the gospel. I mean, that was essentially the, the thrust uh, there. Um, the date in 1863, I think you're, you're pointing to, is the um, uh, the executions, right, in uh, in uh Mankato, is that the date you're referring to? I don't have it in front of me. Um, yeah, yeah. So, 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 in May fifth, um, eighteen sixty three, you had mentioned it was sort of like a a merger of like um, a lot of different events that that really kind of like spurred spurred out. Um, I can't remember the, the the location of it. Well, certainly the um, well, this is a December eighteen sixty three. Um, the uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the um, another kind of moment here. Uh, was when uh, uh, the moment I didn't know is, you know, we, we associate um, Abraham Lincoln with the Emancipation Proclamation, right? And uh, ending the, you know, ending, ending slavery uh, eventually um, and, um, you know, fighting on the side of uh, emancipation. And it turns out that like one of the things I came across in, in research for the new book is that, you know, at the same time, he had on his desk um, the Emancipation Proclamation, and he was at, he was essentially waiting for a Union victory before he wanted to issue it, right? So he already had it drafted up, but he didn't want to issue it at a moment of weakness. He wanted to issue it at a moment of strength. So it was sitting on his desk waiting for a Union victory. And while it was sitting on his desk, this other thing came across his desk from Minnesota, um, and it was a request from uh, General Sibley, a Union general in, in Minnesota, to execute 300 
Native American men, Dakota men, for their part in a rebellion. Um, uh, uh, that, but basically, they were being starved out uh, by the uh, Union soldiers, and they rebelled against this. And they wanted to execute 300 men. And, and Lincoln um, actually commuted the sentences of all but 38 of them. But he signed off on 38. And still the, the largest mass execution in U.S. history um, uh, occurs, um, you know, by under the authorization of Abraham Lincoln, um, you know, there um, uh, in, in, in a far northern state of, uh, of, of Minnesota. Hmm. Yeah. So, so, so the, uh, so I, I wanted to, to read this if I could. Um, it says, uh, this encounter on May 5th, 1863 contains multiple narrative streams, each of which tells a different story about America. The question is, which do we follow? Do we tell the story of Fort Snelling, the military outpost established to protect the westward expansion of settler colonialism? Do we embark back down the Mississippi River to Missouri and the story of enslaved Africans in the South? Do we push upriver from St. Paul to its headwaters? Um, and it, so, so it it really seems like in one specific event, you could probably extrapolate a lot of really ugly history yeah. um, of of America. Yeah, that event is is remarkable. I'll to give you the it, it, it's related to this uh, story in Minnesota, but um, but essentially what happens here is um, the Emancipation Proclamation is issued. Um, and it is, you know, news of it gets around. There is, um, a, a group of enslaved people in Missouri, um, that, uh, hear the news. Um, a guy named Robert Hickman, um, is an enslaved man who sets out to free himself and his neighbors, um, uh, on this news. Now it didn't really apply to him because he was in Missouri, right? Uh, which was not a state in, in full in rebellion, which is the only where the Emancipation Proclamation actually applied to. But nonetheless, he's like, nope, we're going to take this opportunity. Here we go, and he built a raft. And I mean, it's this, it's this courageous uh, story, right? Of, of uh, his family, his neighbors, and they just like launch out into the Mississippi River, saying, "We're going to make a, a a run for it." Um, and they are picked up in the Mississippi River by a steamboat. Uh, heading north. And that time, the the Union Army actually cl- controlled the Mississippi River is kind of what they were hoping for, is that they would get picked up by... Uh, and this this steamboat was heading for uh, for Fort Snelling, um, uh, which is just kind of up, up uh, near the Minneapolis-St. Paul um, area. So they they um, hitched a cable to them, towed them north uh, to freedom. Uh, and they disembark, uh, you know, uh, uh, at Fort Snelling, um, just, just uh, around Minneapolis. Uh, but what the the other part of the story, though, is that what this boat was doing after they got off and it was also being commissioned uh, to load the remnants of the Dakota people uh, who had been rounded up and forcibly put in these concentration camps for a brutal winter outside where many, many of them died. And this was the remnants that had not died of disease and exposure, uh, mostly women, children, older uh, and older people loaded them up on this steamboat and ship and were exiling them out of the state of shipping them out of the state of Missouri. Uh, right. And so this, this, again, this kind of simultaneous, you know, thing of this, this boat towing one group of people, uh, to freedom and, uh, one group of people, uh, to banishment and, and exile. And, and I think we often don't tell these stories together of the, the, um, the story of indigenous people, the story of African-Americans, and I think it's one of the things I'm wanting to do in this book is make sure we hold these stories together, um, uh, because really the 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 treatment of Native Americans, the treatment of African Americans, stems from the same root, and that is the basically this idea that America was intended by God to be a kind of promised land for European Christians, and everyone else uh, was subservient. Yeah, that's such a tough part of history, right? It's so hard to reconcile our own views today with the views that we see taught, the views that we see accepted and embraced um, in our in our history. It's interesting too with the Emancipation Proclamation, right, that it proclaimed freedom for slaves in the southern states, but not in the border states. No, that's right. And what yep. in 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 the weird like you see the um you see the historical realities that people deal with, right? With and that being like um, Lincoln needed the border states, and so he didn't want to dis, you know disrupt the apple cart or whatever it's called, just you know disturb it. Um, 
and he would just he, he was being a politician as well as a man of his time. How do we judge yeah. people in history? Like a lot of times, like for instance, the 1619 project, I know Will is a really big fan of that. I'm not a big fan of it. I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's informative for sure. I think it's something we need to, um, uh, look at and wrestle with no doubt, but I'm not convinced by all the arguments, but what, what do we do when we're looking back on, back on the past and we're and we have a 21st century mindset and we're judging Abraham Lincoln according to 21st century standards. Is that what we should do? Should we do something yeah. different? Well, I, I guess the question for me is like, uh, for what purpose? Right. Are we doing this? Um, you know, so I think in the abstract, um, you might ask that one way. But I, I think, you know, if if the purpose of history and the purpose of our understanding history is to help us understand how we got to where we are so we can create a better present and a better future, um, then, you know, I think we have to kind of bring a critical lens uh, uh, to history. Now, you know, um, it, it's, I mean, it was, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Lincoln fan. You know, I've, I've read all kinds of Lincoln biographies, um, you know, and it, 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 uh, it was hurtful when I read, you know, and kind of shocking when I read this story of him, you know, so who's responsible for the largest mass execution ever by the U.S. federal government? It's Abraham Lincoln. Um, like, that's a tough thing to swallow, right? Um, I don't think it takes away from, you know, all the courageous stuff he did, or, or like you said, the fact that the Emancipation Proclamation was a tool of war, uh, right? Um, aimed at weakening the Confederate states only, um, you know, it, it, there was some kind of pragmatic um, wartime president. Um, now, that's not to say it wasn't without any principle, um, but it was issued in a very pragmatic, strategic way. Um, you know, it's not until after the war that we get the abolishment of slavery. Um, so I think we got to be clear eyed about that. But but I, I the one thing I have, I think, come to um, train myself out of saying, because I, I think it's usually a kind of defensive reaction that isn't very useful for the present or the future is this phrase, well, they were men of their time, um, right? Because um, I, I don't really think we ought to let them off the hook in the way that that phrase usually does, right? Now, of course they are. We are too, right? Um, all of us have blind spots. Our children are going to look at us and go, oh my God, how in the world did they support X or did they think Y, right? Um, my nine-year-old how, already does. What's up right, with that? Right. That's right, right. That's right. Um, and, you know, so so that's, clearly the case. But, you know, I do think in terms of, you know, if we're thinking about Christianity, for example, um, you know, I think what in, in terms of my own faith, my own kind of Christian orientation, like, I really want to know the truth about this, right? So that um, I think the responsibility of every generation is to kind of receive what's handed down, right? That's what a tradition is. You receive what's handed to you, but you can't receive it blindly, right? You, every generation has its own responsibility to sift it, right? To kind of look, to examine it, and you you know you got to be willing to pitch the parts that are bad right and and to pitch the parts that are just racist you know i think in the case of white of white christianity i mean i'll give you like one very personal example um i didn't find out till after i wrote the last book that had a lot of family stories in it um that my grandfather who i loved very deeply um was a deacon in east macon baptist church um and that one of his jobs on sunday morning uh, he's ex Navy guy, kind of you know rough and tumble, and that one of his jobs, one of his assignments on Sunday morning, was to stand outside on the front steps of the church and make sure that nobody who was not white uh, did not enter the building. Uh, so he was essentially a, a bouncer on Sunday morning to make sure only white people entered the sanctuary, right? And and it wasn't a kind of wink wink nod nod thing. I mean, this was his official role as a deacon. Uh, right at the church on Sunday morning, and, and you know when you when you realize that that these ideas um, of white supremacy, uh, of white superiority, how entangled they got with Christianity, um, you know it it's a it's going to be a multi generational effort, I think, to untangle uh, these things. And we're, we're I think we're only responsible for what we can see. Now I do think we are responsible for seeing, right? We can be willfully ignorant and still be, uh, culpable. Um, but, but I think, you know, we can see as far as we can see and we're responsible for doing something with what we can see. 
I think that that's really good because um, I know like, you know, for <clears throat> for me, you know, being a person of color, like I recognize that um, MLK Jr. lived not necessarily the best life, you know, um, he had mistresses, you know, he, he had a reportedly love of beautiful women. Um, and I can acknowledge that, <clears throat> but I can also say, you know, the net, uh, benefit of his speeches, whatever, it really kind of moved the equality conversation, like, uh, towards a, a more perfect union. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate you, um, you, you mentioning that, but, but I, I, I want to talk to, talk to you about the, um, <clears throat> you're mentioned in the book about the trail of tears and black wall street, um, you know, in Tulsa. And I'm, I'm, I'm specifically interested in that because my, my dad was born in 1928 in Boley, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm a really bad like genealogy person. Like, so the farthest I've ever been able to go is like, I think I know who my grandma is. Uh, I never met her in person, but but like, I've always wondered like, okay, my dad was born in 1928. So I wonder if my parent or my, my grandparents were near there or or around there because it's it's not too far away. So, so maybe you can talk about um, sort of the, the connection there. Well, you know, one of the things I, I, again, I've tried to do in the book is to hold together uh, the stories of um, kind of African American trajectory in the country, and the stories that are much less told, I think, of, of Native Americans um, here. And you know, when I, I so I started with the story of um, they got all kinds of national publicity, right? The Tulsa Race Massacre, um, because it had its 100th anniversary in 2021, and so there was a lot of national news or HBO documentaries. Uh, there was movies. There, like, so there's lots of stuff um, going on. New York Times wrote about it. Um, so that got a lot of airtime. Uh, but right behind that story is the whole story of Oklahoma, uh, right? Uh, which I vaguely knew, but I think the more I dug into it, uh, again, for I'm you know my 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 people are from Mississippi and Georgia, uh, right? And so if if I begin to ask the question, well, okay, so that family Bible that I have from 1815, that's from that family that was in middle Georgia, where did they first get that land from? Right. And the family lore on my side was, well, they got it from a land lottery uh, in Georgia. That That's the answer. And that's as far as the answer went. Right. Um, and then you're like, well, where'd the land come from that they were giving away for free to white people in the land lottery? Well, of course it came from Cherokee, uh, people that had been forcibly removed uh, uh, on the Trail of Tears. And the, it's called the Trail of Tears because they were literally forced off the land m- many times at the tip of a bayonet, uh, loaded onto trains, ferry boats, forced to walk. Um, and, you know, as many as 20% of them died. They, many of them were moved across uh, during the winter with no provisions. Uh, and they ended up in Oklahoma. So all of the Native Americans, you know, from all the Southeast, Alabama, Mississippi, um, uh, Georgia, and waves were like shipped off to Oklahoma. And Oklahoma, up until that point, was this kind of little hole in the map that used to say unorganized territory, um, is what you would see in the in the in the maps of around 1800. For so the other places had been organized. It was just this hole in the map. And essentially, the federal government said, "Well, let's ship them there." Um, and so the state of Oklahoma was essentially a refugee dumping ground uh, for Native Americans that were forced off their lands, um, you know, from all over um, uh, the Southeast. So there's that backstory uh, of like who even is there, right? And how are they there um, that that is sitting behind the whole story of Black Wall Street and this rise of this Black middle class um, that's, that's then summarily attacked by over a period of days over 300 African Americans killed by their white neighbors in just a span of a few, few days, literally just roving bands of white people with guns and torches um, over a period, not just one night, but multiple days, right? They went to sleep, got back up, ate breakfast, got the guns and torches and went at it again. Um, uh, So it's pretty stark. But when you see again, that history behind there and you know, what the kind of white establishment again, with kind of Christian moral justifications were willing to do to native Americans, that the stories of lynchings and uh, uh, the pogrom and and uh, in Tulsa becomes less mysterious, really. Yeah, it's uh, so heartbreaking and heart wrenching to even imagine that happening. The fear, 
um, trying to put yourself in the mindset. I mean, it's difficult now, um, the mindset of the perpetrators and the people that were perpetrated again. It's difficult now, and yet all of us are uh, susceptible to groupthink. We're susceptible to the culture that's going to tell us what it thinks is right, and we're going to, f- you know, f- shape our morality off that, which doesn't li- um, get us off the hook, right? Because I, I believe in a personally universal truth, right? So if there's a standard by which things are judged, right? Then, then you can get to it at some level, but you can't just say, well, it's just relevant. I was okay because everyone was telling me it was okay. I, I, I agree that that isn't, that just doesn't sound right. Um, but obviously we are historical people beings that are placed in this world by whatever origin story you find most appealing. And we're placed in this uh, world and we are subject to the, to the forces of history, to the forces of powers that are shaping the culture in the world. And we've talked on this show about the doctrine of discovery before. Um, This idea that um, white Europeans essentially had a right to, religiously had a right by God to do whatever they wanted in order of discovering. Connect that with connect that with the 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 doctrine or whatever you'd call it of manifest destiny. Mm. I know they're different things. I know that, you know, one is not the other. Um, and maybe not even relate, like, uh, like officially connected in any way, but talk about those underlying currents of white supremacy that gave rise to both the doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny. No, it's a great question. And I mean, I think the impulse is the same, right? Um, you know, there's other, also other things like the idea of America as a new Zion or a promised land, you know, those kinds of sentiments are kind of in the same basket of conceptual and things that we're talking about. Uh, but I think one of the things I was just, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, surprised by is just how deep and uh, overt these sentiments were, right? They weren't just kind of generally in the ether. I mean, these things, the Doctor of Discovery, right, has developed over a period of 50 years in the 15th century, and they're in official papal edicts that are written down in black and white, and you can look them up today, right? And they were written in Latin, but you can tra- they're translated into English. You can read them for yourself. Um, there's a whole uh, website called doctrineofdiscovery.org that has all the original uh, uh, documents. And when you read those documents, you you, you really do think that, that um, you know, they were willing to sort of say out loud, right? Things like, oh, no, the uh, um, uh, and even, even in a, a Supreme Court case in the U.S., for example, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in the 1800s talks about, uh, that incorporates the doctrine of discovery into U.S. law will say things like, uh, they were convinced by the superior genius of Europeans, right? Uh, and their superior religion, uh, that that was what gave them the right right to the land, what gave them the right, uh, to enslave other people. I mean, it was really that, uh, straightforward understanding of their superiority, um, you know, uh, that that really uh, lent itself uh, to this. And so this idea of manifest destiny, right, is, you know, once there, it's, it's interesting that um, also remembering that, that one of the big conflicts between the original 13 colonies um, and, and the British leading up to the revolution is that the British crown would not let the colonies expand west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, right. And they wanted to, the British colonists wanted to kind of start moving into those lands. And the, the crown was saying, no, no, we're reserving that. Those rights are ours, not yours. And so that was a big complaint, actually, uh, that, that they were um, not able to do further incursions west. And then, of course, once it starts happening, the Louisiana Purchase, there is this idea that this, that the country should go from ocean to ocean, right, coast to coast. And that that was, again, this kind of the will of God that this entire continent east to west um, you know, middle part of the continent should be um, occupied uh, by people who are European uh, and Christian. And you can see what happens, like, you know, um, there's getting to be more reporting on this, uh, but what happens to Native Americans, right, uh, you know, who aren't killed, outright killed? Uh, there was certainly a, a, an overt, uh, you know, the, the saying, for example, that the only good Indian is a dead Indian uh, was repeated over and over and over um, again. Um, so there were clearly this sense of just extermination, uh, and genocide, but 
beyond that, the ones that survive, if you look at what happened and how the federal government responded to them, you'll see this doctrine of discovery at play, right? That So whether they sort of force them onto small reservations, usually on lands that are not farmable, not arable, and that no white settlers want, um, stuck there. And then what do they do? They um, establish churches and boarding schools that are typically run by Christian denominations and funded by the federal government uh, because they're going to Christianize and civilize uh, uh, Native Americans on these on these reservations. So you can kind of see that, um, you know, for those who are left, like they're going to sort of forcibly convert them and, uh, quote unquote, civilize them right into the superior uh, European culture. So it, it's deep, deep, deep. Um, you know, in our in our kind of cultural and, and religious DNA um, in the country. Awesome. You know, I was wondering, um, have you ever had any interaction with, like, um, in, any proponents of uh, the Black supremacy movement in terms of, like, the way that they view history, that, you know, white people were essentially like a mutation um, or like were invented by a, a scientist in a lab. Have you heard any of this stuff about I this? No. Oh, my <laughs> word, dude. It's yeah. OK, so I have someone yeah. I know that um, that question has talked to me about, about some you. of this. That question says more about you than anything. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess it's real. Look it up. I mean, but, uh, anyway, so that's all go ahead, Will. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, so I want to, um, switch gears from, um, black supremacy to, um, the, the report that you guys did mm. along with, uh, Brookings Institute. Um, the report's called a Christian nation with a question mark, um, understanding the threat of Christian nationalism to American democracy and culture, which, uh, we'll we'll make sure we put the link in our show notes, but it's a fantastic report um, and has a lot of really great insight, lots of research. Um, and and I, I, I'd like for you to kind of unpack that and, and maybe talk about, you know, what what new light does the report you know, shine on on the subject of Christian nationalism. But but before before you you do that, maybe you can just. You know, somebody's coming into this cold. They've never heard the term Christian nationalism. Yeah. Maybe you can just define what what that is. Right. Yeah. Well, I you know, should say that you know one of the things we found in the survey is that thirty seven percent of Americans have not heard <laughs> of the term, so they would uh, have some company uh, if they haven't heard of the term. Uh, it's essentially a, a, a term that has come to been used really in the last four or five years. I think I think to describe this, a lot of the ideas we're talking about, which is this kind of idea that the the, the that America has been should be um, a Christian nation, right, and that people who are Christian should be in charge of it, uh, that, that it's a divine plan, like those kinds of sentiments. And and so this term Christian nationalism has come to kind of stand in for um, the uh, kind of rise of this uh, the sentiment that we've seen kind of in our political uh, context. Awesome. And, oh, go ahead, Will. Well, I was going to say, and, and, and can you, can you talk about what, um, like what the, re- what, you know, the, the report yeah. does to kind of, you know, unpack the impact of Christian nationalism in the country? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the first things uh, we have to do is you have to get the definition um, of it. I mean, so the, uh, so this is a public opinion survey um, that we, uh, that we conducted again with the Brookings um, institution. Um, and so it's a fairly large uh, survey. And what we did is we, we basically had about a dozen questions that, measured various kinds of sentiments like that. At the end of the day, we settled on five questions that really hang together or five statements that really hang together. Uh, And by hanging together, I mean, like statistically, we can measure that they're highly correlated uh, with one another. So if you answer one way on one of these questions, you're very likely to answer a similar way on one of the other ones. So out of the dozen or so that we tested, these five tend to kind of coalesce into um, kind of one group. And so we use these as a kind of um, uh, a kind of amalgamation uh, or joint measure of of Christian nationalism. So I'll just read you the statements real quickly so you get a sense of it. So these are all agree disagree questions um, uh, in the, from the survey. Uh, so questions like um, God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all America, all areas of American society. The U.S. government should declare America a Christian nation. 
being Christian is an important part of being truly American. Uh, U.S. law should be based on Christian values. If the U.S. moves away from our Christian foundations, we will not have a country anymore. So it's those five questions that that we um, uh, made a composite measure. Uh, and then we looked at people who either strongly agreed with those or strongly disagreed and people who were in the middle as well. And, and the top line finding that we found is that um, – we had we found about three in ten Americans who are either what we called Christian nationalism adherents or Christian nationalism sympathizers. So an adherent is one who strongly agreed with all of those uh, questions. About ten percent of the country fell into that category that strongly agree with all of them, but another nineteen percent. Uh, of the country uh, uh, fell into the category of uh, somewhat agreeing uh, with those statements. So taken together, 10 plus 19, that's uh, 29%, about three in 10 Americans who are either adherents or sympathizers. Um, And so then we looked at the other side as well. Um, On the far side, uh, 29% of the country strongly disagreed with all those statements. We call those rejectors. And then another 39% somewhat disagreed. Uh, we called them skeptics. Um, so overall, about three in 10 who lean that direction uh, and about you know two thirds who lean uh, kind of the other, uh, uh, the other direction uh, away from uh, affirming Christian nationalism. Yeah. And, you know, um, w- within the first couple of pages, you'll, you'll, you'll find those questions um, and some of the results. And I mean, it's, it's like, like if you're, if you're, report just stop there i think it's enough for people to chew on <laughs> but but like you go even deeper and i i'm, I'm curious though about the categories like so the here and sympathize your skeptics yep. like is is that kind of like a uniform way of of categorizing people because i noticed like like scott um samuel perry and yeah uh, sam perry and, yeah and andrew and andrew whitehead um kind of use some of the same same terms and the the books and the research that they've done yeah, it's a similar methodology. I mean, they use words like ambassadors instead of adherents, uh, for example. Uh, these are words that I should just be clear that both in their case and in our case, um, these are labels that uh, the researchers applied to these categories, right? Uh, so they're not things that that the respondents themselves, uh, the respondents themselves only uh, replied directly to the underlying questions. And then when we analyze the data, looking for the patterns, uh, these are the groups we kind of broke them out in, into. And we intentionally picked slightly different labels because our underlying questions are slightly different than the ones that Perry uh, and Whitehead used. And take their, the book is Taking America Back for God, if your listeners want to kind of check out their work, which is fantastic work. Um, actually, they we consulted with them some on the study as well. Um, uh, but we, we want to use slightly different terms because we did use slightly different measures. We didn't find wildly different uh, findings. We find slightly less uh, adherents and sympathizers. I think it's because the questions that we use um, are slightly harder questions um, than than the ones that they use. But you know, similar patterns across across the board. So, what does the report or even your findings in helping us interpret it for those who haven't read the report? What does it tell us about Christian nationalism's? influence on the January 6th attack on the Capitol and even its influence in the kind of um, foment we're seeing in America right now and dissatisfaction um, that's kind of like palpably felt around. Yeah. Well, they, they, you know, these findings are highly stratified by party. Um, so that's kind of one thing that we we find. So, for example, you know, um, among uh, uh, those who identify as Republican, um, while we only find three in 10 Americans in one of those two, two categories that lean toward uh, either adherents or sympathizers leaning toward those Christian nationalism sentiments, uh, among Republicans, it's 54%. Uh, who are 21 percent who are Christian nationalism adherents, another 33 percent who are Christian nationalism sympathizers. And that compares to only 15 percent of Democrats. Right. So, uh, you know, they're 
like four times as likely uh, Republicans are to kind of hold these sentiments uh, as, as Democrats are. And then on the religious front, a kind of similar, you know, finding that it, it's it's nearly three quarter or sorry, nearly two thirds of white evangelical Protestants, 64 percent who are in one of these top two categories, 29 percent of white evangelicals are Christian national adherents, an, an additional 35 percent are Christian nationals and sympathizers. Um, uh, they're, they're really the only group in that high majority uh, a category. So it, it, what what's I think the reason why we're hearing more about this is because it is coalescing sort of more in one uh, one of our two political parties. Um, so it, again, it's a majority sentiment uh, among uh, among self-identified uh, Republicans. It does connect to uh, you know things like um, believing the election was stolen. Uh, the 2020 election was stolen from uh, from President Trump. Uh, not believe, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, not seeing January 6 as an insurrection, but having a more sympathetic view uh, towards it. These things are connected, and but I think the the challenging thing, and for me as somebody who's uh, you know white and Christian myself, um, I think that the disturb more disturbing thing is that these if people who hold these Christian nationalist views. Um, also are more likely to hold kind of anti-Black views, anti-immigrant views, anti-Muslim views, anti-Semitic views, um, and that those things tend to be connected. Now, if you think about the history we've been talking about, um, that's not so surprising, um, uh, perhaps, but it is, um, I think, challenging and, and uh, disturbing that we sort of see uh, these things still with us and and correlated in this way and, a you know, a, a public opinion survey that was taken in 2023. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And your, your, your report also, um, showed something that was sort of surprising to me that the Christian nationalism is on a decline. Um, um, and, and I'm curious on your thoughts on, on, you know, if that, if that's tied to, you know, maybe Trump not being in office anymore, or, or if there's some other, influence that you know like people are are waking up or whatever not i don't i don't mean to use that like a q on term or whatever but yeah <laughs> but I'm well i mean you're right that it's not growing there has been a slight dip um i wouldn't make too much of it uh, for some of the reasons why you just said right that we um we don't have Trump in office, um, but as we're starting to move into campaign season, uh, you know, we got debates uh, this week, uh, Republican pre- uh, uh, presidential debates this week. Uh, so we start moving more into that season uh, and all the campaign machinery starts getting revved up. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be tracking it, actually, um, on a quarterly basis between now and the 2024 election. So we'll see. Um, you know, whether this ki- kind of kicks back up once more of it is in the headlines. Um, but we are seeing some of these themes absolutely being um, uh, kind of fronted by some of the Republican uh, candidates. I mean, it's it's very prominent in, in Trump's rhetoric, uh, for, for sure. Yeah. Are you uh, I'm assuming well, that um, I'm identifying my assumption. I'm making it public <laughs> like as we're supposed to do. Right. So we can we can all figure out if we're on the same page. I'm assuming that you think it will increase in this. Like, is that true? Do you, do you imagine as your. Yeah, I that's, if, you know, if I were a betting man and we were going to kind of put our money down on the trend. Sure, lines, yeah. yeah, I would I would say that it, it's going to go up, um, if only because it'll be a response to the deluge of media. Right. That we're going right. to see. Right. Just more people will hear it, more people will be reignited again, people yep. that maybe have gone down, like, you know, can feel empowered again to come up and raise their voice on social media and all all over the right. place. So this, you know, obviously, um, this report is uh, very disturbing in some ways, um, very informative, enlightening, um, for sure. How do you imagine this report? And the reports that you guys are are producing, specifically on Christian nationalism, things like that. Yeah. How do you find it being applied, or how do you hope it is applied to yeah. policy, to political st- uh, strategists, and in the community leaders that um, that are trying to figure out <laughs> this intersection yeah. of religion and politics, especially in this next election no, season? It's, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, so you know, we're a 
uh, again, a kind of, you know, public charity. So, I mean, our, our job is to put things into the public. And I think one of the things we hope it'll happen, again, it'll help journalists write more accurate stories using actual data. But I also think for the general public, as reporters write about it and use this data, as pastors read it, as denominational leaders read it, um, you know, I'm hoping it's the yellow warning light on the dashboard, um, you know, kind of saying like, we've got a problem here, you know, and it, it's, it's uh, again, there's kind of a couple of ways you can look at it. You know, on the one hand, uh, two to, by a margin of two to one, most Americans reject this idea, right? That America's designed to be a promised land for European Christians. Uh, they reject that idea from the doctrine of discovery. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, it's 30% of the country, and it's a majority of white evangelicals and a majority of one of our two political parties uh, believe this uh, sentiment. And, you know, just to be uh, as clear as I can about it, uh, you know, this I, I, I do think this is one of the big choices we have faced in American history, that we've had these conflicting views of the country and, you know, if you just stated historically, you know, are we a pluralistic democracy where everyone, regardless of race or regardless of religion, stands on equal footing as citizens? Or are we uh, a divinely ordained, you know, nation that was intended by God to be a kind of promised land for European Christians? Those two are fundamentally incompatible views of the nation. Right. And and the, the one that's the Christian nationalist view is fundamentally anti-democratic. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, that flashing light will kind of go off um, in a way that makes pastors and um, church leaders and lay people say, well, hold on. Right. They hear that getting popped up in Sunday school class. They're going to wait a minute. Let's talk about that. Right. Um, let's really unpack that, because I think sometimes these things get echoed without really fully thinking about the implications uh, of them, right? And so kind of slowing yeah, I, it down and having that conversation is important. I'm curious if maybe you can give us your your insight on, on, on this sort of symbiotic relationship that, you know, Christian nationalist adherents um, or between Christian nationalist adherents and, and politicians, because like, you know, I've, I've spoke, I don't like, we've spoken to several politicians and other folks up in DC, you know, and it, it does seem to be that the prevailing thought is, you know, our representatives are just doing what the voters want, which, which is great. You know, Hey, democracy works, you know, but, but like, if I'm looking at this report and I'm, and I'm looking at, you know, should U S laws be based on Christian values and 81%, you know, say yes, <laughs> like, like I'm probably going to start, you know, um, like trying to pass legislation um, that has a Christian sort of overtone to it. And I'm and I'm curious on 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 your thoughts on that relationship. Like are are people, you know, wanting to, you know, adhere to the Christian nationalism ideology? We're founded as a Christian nation, so on and so forth. Um, and I'm going to find politicians to like you know support those things or is it politicians are looking at this sort of like fertile field of believers you know and and say hey i'm just going to pull on this christian string here and see what happens oh they seem to like it i'm going to pull on this one now too so like can you can you just talk yeah. about that, that that relationship between the two yeah i mean you know I, I think it's this you know in our current kind of political system where you know uh, every word every politician says is over focus grouped and over polled. And, um, you know, they're testing it out to see, well, if I say it this way, if I say it that way, um, you know, I, we could certainly be end up in danger point. And just to be clear, that number in the general population, it, it's it's not 80, it's it's 40 in the general population, 40 percent. Mm -hmm. But yeah. still, 40 percent of the country saying Christian law, you know, law should be based only on Christian values is a lot. Um, uh, and so I think there is a danger where people, you know, politicians will just like put their finger in the wind, you know, see which way the wind is blowing. And that's the way they go to get votes. Um, you know, that's, uh, I think not exactly the most responsible way to act as a political leader in a democracy, right? Um, you have a, you have a leadership, um, opportunity, right? And you, and, and, you know, leading people to, um, a, a place that's more democratic, that's more, welcoming, that's more supportive of equality of their fellow citizens. Like that's the responsibility of a elected leader as well. It's not just kind of 
going whichever way the wind blows. I mean, our, our founding fathers were pretty clear about that, that that was a real danger of democracy, right, is is the kind of mob mentality or, you know, you kind of get uh, 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 folks that are kind of, uh, you know, go off the rails over here. And it's part of the job of our elected leaders to, to let me take one one, I think, um, sterling example of this was John McCain. Um, and I remember John McCain, he was in a debate, and you probably remember this moment too, where this this woman uh, started to go on this rant about Obama being a Muslim and a terrorist. Um, and McCain, like very, you know, gently walked over and he took the microphone from her in this live town hall where she's attacking his opponent. And he says, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, right? Uh, 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 you know, Barack Obama is a Christian. He's a good family man. And like, you know, says like, we're not going to have this debate go down that rabbit hole. Um, and I think that's the kind of leadership we've got to have really from, you know, so steer back to the things that matter. And you know, there's plenty of things that McCain and Obama disagreed about, right? That they could be, that they're, that, that his supporters could be upset about, but that wasn't the way uh, that, and I think McCain knew that that was undermining democracy, right? It was, you know, and it wasn't worth winning a few political points to undermine the whole system. And I think we just got to have more people willing to stand up in that way. Yeah, I completely agree. I want to push in, like, I want to push on this idea of the law real quick, because we've talked about this before. And laws are, laws reflect the morality of a nation. We've talked about this with different lawyers, different philosophers, theologians, right? Laws reflect the morality of a nation. And I'm wondering how, you know, it's almost as if we could become so far, like you could swing the pendulum and say, well, if this smells like Christian, we ought to get rid of it. It's the, we, 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 we can't have, you're, you're oppressing me by your Christian like moral laws, or you can't push your morality on me. Or, you know, keep, keep your, keep your Christian rules out of my body. Okay. And t I, I can understand the sentiment. If I was in a country that was run by Sharia law, or there is a potential that it would be, I would be um, nervous and wondering what parts of those laws will help me and what parts of those laws will hurt me. But what, how do we how do we figure out and wrestle through the concepts that are so deeply moral in nature? Even our we 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 interviewed just recently a congresswoman who used the word evil, which is a distinctly moral category. That isn't a mm -hmm. mental health category. That is a moral category. That is evil and good. I mean, we hear that all the time. How do we reconcile all these things with trying to have a pluralistic society? Um, and maybe yeah. some of those people that said, hey, I'm kind of a sympathizer. Maybe they're thinking, you know, the Ten Commandments aren't all that bad. I mean, we could take out the first four. I know that has to do with God. But then the, the next ones, they're, they're, they seem pretty good. Um, but what, what do you yeah. think? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you could start there, I guess. And you could say, look, the Ten Commandments aren't Christian, right? Uh, the Ten Commandments are Jewish. Uh, they come from the Torah. Mic drop. Right? Um, uh, they're not Christian. And and before that, they come from the Code of Hammurabi, uh, right? Uh, so they've got deeper roots than, than even that. Um, so they've got a deep moral core that's not exclusively Christian. Um, but, but I think to your bigger point— um, this is the question of America, right? I mean, this is the hard thing that we're trying to do. Um, it, it is, I think, an unprecedented experiment, and it's why it is so difficult. Like, there aren't many blueprints for doing this successfully. So we're trying to figure it out, right? But, I, I, but I, at the end of the day, I think, you know, uh, like one Christian virtue I, I'd say I would love to see more of is hospitality. Um, right. This this idea of a kind of, you know, welcome and respect it doesn't mean you kind of get to roll over when you think somebody's wrong. Right. And it doesn't mean you can't argue uh, vociferously, but it, but it does mean that you've got to figure out like where the ends of power are. Right. And, and where and, and so um, this idea 
you know, find, find, kind of rediscovering a kind of Christian justification for democracy, I think it's really important, right? Because that means, for example, that if we lose a political argument um, and we really think we're right and they're wrong, right? Uh, and we've got good religious and moral reasons for thinking that. Well, what do we do? Well, I, in a democracy, you reorganize and you try again, right? Um, so you lobby people, you organize people, you knock on doors, you, you know, uh, those are the things that you do in a democracy. And 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 I think what we've lost is this sense that, um, you know, uh, also in a democracy, when we vote, when we clash over policy differences and disagreements and moral disagreements, um, you know, uh, if we can hang on to the idea that these are our fellow citizens, right, that we're disagreeing with. Uh, but I think what what's happened is we kind of have devolved into this sense that, no, 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 these are our enemies, right? These are our, these are not our fellow citizens that with whom we disagree. These are our enemies who are out to destroy the country. And whenever the rhetoric, right, reaches that level, um, I mean, that, that too is just corrosive, right, of democracy, because then every vote, every policy disagreement becomes a kind of battle to the death, um, right, instead of one that we realize, okay, we're going to win some, we're going to lose some, and when we lose, we reorganize and we try to kind of, you know, uh, out, outflank them next time, but, but within the guardrails of what a democratic uh, polity allows, right, um, we're going to kind of not kind of go around that, uh, but it, 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 it requires a kind of... Um, confidence um i think and less fear um than than we're than we're seeing out there right now yeah so so your your report um covers a lot of ground um and again I'm, i can't recommend it enough um for our our audience first first buy buy robbie's um book and then once you're done reading that then you can read the uh the report <laughs> Um, <laughs> all light bedtime yeah. table reading. <laughs> yes. Or vice versa <laughs> or vice versa either way. <laughs> um, so, so I, I'm curious, like what, what, er, what other areas of Christian nationalism do you, do you feel need, you know, more research, more exploration? Um, and, you know, does, does PRI have any, um, you know, follow-up studies planned or, or anything like that? Yeah. So we're going to be doing, um, uh, so we're going to be tracking these, Christian nationalism uh, attitudinal attitudinal questions throughout all the way through the 2024 election. Um, we also have just uh, kind of locked and fielded uh, right now in the field is um, our um, 2023 American Value Survey, which is a survey we also do with Brookings every fall. So where we take the temperature of Americans on a whole range of issues. So we've got this, we've got what people think about the candidates, we've got you know, abortion, immigration, you know, uh, you name it. We've got kind of all the things we're, we're kind of clashing on uh, uh, here in that in that survey. That'll be out October 25th at the Brookings um, uh, Institution. And we just put out a, a pretty unique report today um, that actually that uh, that was uh, a set of focus groups that we did in the South about what people thought about the reconfiguration of public space. Uh, to be more inclusive, particularly where there had been Confederate, you know, monuments to the Confederacy, um, you know, in the, which is dotting, you know, the South um, all over the place. And so what happens when those come down? Uh, what, where do they go? Um, and what do you do with them uh, if they do come down? And what do you put in their place? Um, so we kind of were exploring those questions with uh, a group of um, white citizens and black citizens in, in um, 13 Southern states. We just put out the report um, on, on that. So you can kind of get a sense of when you actually allow people to sit down and talk to you for an hour, um, you know, and kind of dig into these things a little more deeply. Uh, so not just numbers and stats, but actually kind of longer quotes and you can actually hear what people have to say. Yeah. That's awesome. So um, how can people um, learn more about PRRI and more importantly, where can people, um, find your book? Yeah, well, the book is available wherever books are sold. Um, let me put in a plug for your local bookstore. Um, whoever that is, um, it's available on bookshop.com uh, if you don't have a local bookstore and also on all the big box stores and anywhere else you might want to buy a book. Um, it's available audiobook, Kindle, uh, you know, uh, paperback, uh, you name it, any version you want, it, it's there. Are, is it uh, your P voice on the audiobook? 
It is not my voice, alas, <laughs> um, on the audiobook. Um, I know I know the limits of uh, of my abilities, and I, it trust me, it's better that there's a professional actor reading the book than <laughs> than me um, on, on on that front. Uh, and then PRI, you can find it prri.org. That's uh, the report's right there on the homepage. Actually, the one we've been talking about. Uh, and then uh, love it if uh, your listeners want to. I write weekly uh, over at Substack um, at white too long dot net. That's awesome. Well, uh, Mr. Robbie Jones, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, spending some time with us. It's been a really... All right, thanks, Josh. Thanks, Will. Enlightening. And uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, continuing reading all the stuff you guys put out. So yeah. It was great to connect. Great work. Um, And to our audience, yeah, we will see you guys next week. Take care. Bye. Bye.